Okay, let's make a plan for making sense of this increasingly interconnected and interdependent globalizing world on which we live. And this is kind of tough stuff. This is a tall order because the world's so complicated. So many facts and figures and current events and conflicts and economies and so many opinions of so many people all over the planet. You cannot know it all. You can't. Don't try. We're going to make some broad generalizations about different parts of the planet so that we can at least get our feet wet start to introduce ourselves and understand what's happening in different parts of the world. And the way we're going to do this is through a geographic approach. This is Geography 1014. Uh, and a geographic approach may sound complicated and academic and studious, but it's really not. Pretty straightforward. It's simply a way to organize our investigation of the planet, or of anything actually you want to study, by looking at where things are happening. What space or area are things happening at first? It's your first line of offense of understanding and problem solving. It's to think spatially, and that's our number one thing. We're going to think spatially. I <laughs> know, it sounds kind of goofy. It's not spatial Olympics, this is to think spatially. And if that still sounds complicated, it's much more simple to just say this. It's to ask the question where. That's what geographic and spatial thinking is all about. Where is it happening? Think about that first. Now this is not some uniquely novel, cool thing. All modes of inquiry and understanding and all fields of study have some sort of organizing principle behind them. This isn't unique. Uh, historians, for instance, organize by time, linear. This date, this happened at this date, then this happened, this happened, this happened. Biologists by life. So there's the animal kingdom and the plant kingdom and the mushroom kingdom, and they have attributes within them. That's how they organize things. Uh, engineers are organized by form and function or materials or project or something they're working on. So everybody does this in order to figure out what's happening on the planet. And we are all naturally geographers, by the way. You you don't got to take a class to become one. You do it every day of your life and you have been every day of your life. What? How can I say that? You just started this class. No way. We all live in space. Not outer space, here, in named spaces all around us. And not just states, but the named space of the room you're in right this second. And think about this. To get from your dorm space to your classroom space today, you had to navigate through space. You had to navigate through your environment and avoid obstacles and go on right paths. That's thinking spatially. That's thinking geographically. And you do this in your regular life, not just moving from point A to point B, but when you're going to go buy a house, you're going to think about space first. Where is this house at? Oh, is it a nice space? Because uh, I don't want to live in a ghetto bad space. Yes, that spatial thinking happens all the time. What I want you to do for this class, though, is apply that spatial thinking to the broader global context. Because you've been used to thinking spatially day to day. But when you hear about world events, you just take the facts and you don't consider the where. You're not thinking about where. Why there? How is it affecting things around it? That's what you have to work on and tweak just a little bit. Because facts and figures on their own are nice. They're quaint. But without the where, without the spatial component, they're actually losing almost all of their meaning and understanding for you. And let me give you some very concrete examples of this. I'm going to present you with some facts. They're facts. But they are useless almost useless, without the spatial where component. For instance, fact, there are over a billion people in China. That's fact, all right? So what? Well, maybe it'll help me win on Jeopardy, but the where helps you understand a whole hell of a lot more about those billion people in China. Do you see spatial pattern? present itself to you simply by looking at this map. And this map is showing you a one dot, one red dot equals 100,000 Chinese people. And it's giving you a wealth of information. I have not taught you anything about China, about the people of China. I have simply shown you a spatial map of those billion people. And now you know a whole bunch, don't you? Now, who would be interested in this? Oh, I don't know. How about marketers, uh, business people, people who want to sell their goods and services to a billion Chinese people? How about governments that have to provide services to a billion Chinese people? How about foreign military strategists who may want to kill a billion Chinese people? Knowing the where is all important in formulating all the decisions of where to start your Walmart or your 7-Eleven or drop your new nuclear bomb. You're not going to do it in Western China. There's nobody there. You're going to do it in East. 
That's because you know the where. Next fact, AIDS is a rapidly spreading disease. That's a fact. Where makes all the difference. You already knew about AIDS. Where adds a lot more understanding, a wealth of information to you. Again, without me saying much, just look at the pattern. Obviously, Sub-Saharan Africa, an epicenter of the disease, but there are significant parts of Southeast Asia and even India that are prone to this disease as well. Now, who would be interested in where AIDS is? People who may want to not get AIDS or want to help the people with AIDS. Epidemiologists, people who study disease and disease movement through space. Uh, researchers, healthcare workers, government planners, not just the government planners in these governments, governments all over the world are concerned about disease transmission. International aid agencies who may want to help the people with AIDS. On a very local level, prostitutes and businessmen that frequent prostitutes might be very interested in this spatial distribution of where AIDS is. Next fact, oil. Some countries got it. Some countries want it. Duh, like you didn't know that already, but look at the spatial dimension of this. A map showing you millions of barrels produced daily and their flow in the world. Oil is so important to the entire world economy. It affects so many aspects of life without you even thinking about it. Who would this help understand the world a little bit better? Uh, oil producers, oil consumers, governments who sell oil, governments who buy oil, environmentalists who may want to head off the next Exxon Valdez or Gulf oil disaster, a commodities broker. Oil is just so all important to everything in the global economy now that this spatial pattern uh, is important to economists, military strategists, government departments of all ilk, you really can't understand today's current events and current conflicts without knowing about the flow of oil. Next fact, America loves crack. <laughs> yeah, you think I'm making it up just to be funny? America is the number one consumer of cocaine and crack cocaine. Now that's a spatial fact in and of itself, but this map is showing you the distribution routes where cocaine is produced in South America and the flow of that cocaine into America. Who'd be interested in this? Oh, I don't know. Every single government of all the regions involved, border patrol, police of every country, the DEA of America, and increasingly the United States and Mexican military as crack cocaine has now turned into drug wars on the U.S.-Mexican border. That's current events, that's politics, that's military, that's real. That's by knowing the where. Since everything has to happen somewhere, everything happens somewhere, some place, then logically you can see that everything has spatial dimension. Everything. I don't care what your field of study is. I don't care what you're looking at. I don't care what you're trying to understand. It all has a spatial dimension. It is somewhere. It affects things in other places or it moves other places. Everything. Uh, and anything could be studied with a spatial structure. Anything. Really? Anything? Sure. Economics, conflicts, climate change, all have spatial pattern to them. Uh, even wealth, we talked about a ghetto area of a city versus a gated community. That's all space that's very well divided and easily identifiable. Nature has spatial dimension. Where trees grow versus where deserts are. Or how diseases spread or how animals move where they live. Economically, patterns of where a Walmart shopper service area would be. Or I'd get a very small scale of uh, the prostitute customer base of a city block of Manhattan. All of these things can be looked at through a spatial lens. Even abstract ideas can be studied via spatial thinking. Really? Yes. A student challenged me one time. I said, hey, there's nothing that can't be studied spatially. And a student said, what about love? You can't study love spatially. Au contraire, mon frere. Certainly you can. Think about who it is that you're going to fall in love with and marry. All right? You gotta meet the person and see them to fall in love with them or make love with them, I think still, uh, and to marry them. And the likelihood of who you're going to fall in love with can be identified spatially first. It's somebody who's near you. You have to see them and meet them. So people in your town that you're living have a much, much higher likelihood of you falling in love with them than someone in Uzbekistan. You can map out. You can map love right on out and its spatial pattern will become extremely evident to you. You have a much higher likelihood of falling in love in your hometown than you do someone in the Central Asian part of China. Fact, it's spatial thinking. Okay, so whatever it is you want to study, whatever it is you want to understand, whatever it is we're going to focus on in this class, we're going to ask, okay, well, what is it, all right? And where is it happening? Why there? Why not over here? And how does it affect the locale of where it's happening.
And how does it affect the wider region it's happening in? Ultimately, how does it affect the entire world? And yes, bring it on home. Also, how does it affect me? How does it affect us? How does it affect us wherever the us is? Because in this globalizing world, increasingly everything does. It doesn't matter if it's not occurring near you. If the price of tea in China does affect you. The AIDS rate of Sub-Saharan Africa does affect you. A political coup in Bolivia does affect you. Trust me, it will come back, everything's tied together now, to affect you in some way, shape, or form. Okay? So that's the spatial thinking. That's number one, spatial thinking. But we need a schemata of order. We need some sort of roadmap. That's, that's a way of thinking, that spatial thinking. We need something more concrete and tangible. The human brain demands order. If we had a trillion facts thrown up against the wall, we're not just going to go through one at a time and start reading them. The brain will say, organize, organize. What goes here? Think logically here. And we can do this spatially in the world. We can examine things logically uh, by looking at particular sections of the planet one at a time. And that brings us to our number two tool we're going to use in this class. That's the concept of the region. Yeah, region. We are going to go around the planet one section of the planet at a time and look physically at each region. Is it climate or vegetation? Demographically, what's up with the people of that region? Religiously or historically, how do they get to this point? Politically, what's going on? Economically, how do they make money? Socially and culturally, what's happening today in each region to region to region? Make sense? So what's a region? <laughs> it's simply a identified, named space. Three components you need for a region. A, you need some area. I just said it's a named space, so you need some space for something to happen in. You can't be a point or a line, you need an area. Now this space can be very small, like your dorm room or Rhode Island, or it can be gigantic, like Russia or the Pacific Ocean. B, you need some borders or boundaries, some edges around this area that we can identify so that we know that we were in this region, but we're gonna cross a boundary, now we're in a different region. Sometimes these borders or edges are exact, like political borders, borders between states or international borders. These are legally defined, they're exact. So we draw a line, say I'm in Virginia here. I cross that exact line, I'm in West Virginia. I figure out I'm in West Virginia, get my ass back to Virginia as quick as possible. So some are exact, but more often than not, they're fuzzy, fuzzy boundaries. Uh, and this is in the natural world and even the human cultural world. Nature doesn't deal with exact lines. When do you walk out of the Sahara Desert? When do you walk into a forest? It's not exact and tidy. The transitions occur gradually. So it's sandy here in the Sahara and you start walking and there's more grass and then more shrubs and then maybe it's then a forest. Ah. It's different, but you don't know the exact boundary. It's a fuzzy boundary. Human cultural characteristics work exactly the same way. Yes, we can look at ethnic groups or racial groups or language groups or religious groups, and you can look at concentrations of those folks in different parts of the planet, but it's very hard to draw exact lines around them. They're kind of all over the place and ideas and people move. So there are a lot of Russians here, but they're not all there. It's a very fuzzy boundary when you start drawing things like that. We've been doing this your whole life. Uh, you've been taking this for granted, actually. You think about terms like the South in America, the American South. Well, that's a, that's a, a region you identify with immediately when I say it. W can you show me on a map when you drive into the South? It's, it's a fuzzy region to begin with. It's a fuzzy boundary. Or better yet, the American Midwest. When do you drive into the Midwest? And more importantly, what does that even mean? What does the Midwest or the South mean? It actually has a very big meaning to certain people, less meaning to other people, and different meanings for almost everybody. Ah, that brings us to point C, homogeneous trait. Every region needs some homogeneous trait, something that's the same in this area that when you cross that boundary, be it fuzzy or exact, is different somewhere else. This is how we identify every region. What's the same here that's different when you go somewhere else? Here's the crucial part of that. It's entirely user-defined by you, 
by me, by a writer, by a politician. User defined. It's up to you to pick whatever you think's the same about this identified area that you've drawn lines around, right? Having said that, there's an infinite number of regions out there. It's user defined. And you can simultaneously be in an infinite number of regions at the exact same time. Question, what region are you in right now? Are you in the South? Hmm, some people would say, yes. Dixie, hurrah! Others would say, hell no, I'm not in the South, even if they're in the same room. Are you in uh, the state of Virginia? That's exact. Or the United States? That's exact. Are you in the Mid-Atlantic? Mm, that one's fuzzy again. Are you in the Western Hemisphere? That's exact. Are you in a temperate forest region? Hmm, fuzzier on that one too. Uh, perhaps you're in a tobacco producing region or a corn producing region. Maybe you're in an iced tea drinking region. Ha! Huh, some would say that's how you identify the South. That's right. It's up to the user. Everybody down here drinks sweet iced tea. When you go outside of this region, they don't drink iced tea there. That is the homogeneous trait if you want to define it that way for that particular region. Yes? Got it? Okay. So, we've got some spatial thinking. We're thinking about the world in our geographic spatial lens. Now we understand what a region is, a nice way to build a schemata, a roadmap, by identifying different parts of the world. How do we form these regions? Well, we just talked about those homogeneous traits. Ah, well, how do we decide those then? We're going to do this together for this class. That brings us back to where we started with. The number three thing we're going to do in our toolkit is generalization. You've already generalized to make those homogeneous traits. You've said, well, I think roughly this is what's going on in this space on planet Earth. Obviously not everybody drinks iced tea. Obviously not everybody is Islamic or Russian uh, in the region that you've selected by whatever homogeneous trait. You've made a generalization. You've said that mostly this is what's going on in this part of the world. So when we're looking at the different world regions that we're going to use for this class, what traits are we looking at? that we're generalizing about in order to identify those traits and therefore those regions. There are two main categories of things we can take a look at. The physical world uh, versus the cultural world to identifying homogeneous parts of the planet. What's the physical world? That's easy. If you took all the humans off planet Earth and threw them away, everything that's left is the physical world. And every place on Earth has physical traits. Every town, every state, every country, every region has physical traits like climate. How much does it rain there? Or how dry is it? How hot does it get? How cool does it get? And every place has certain vegetation regime. Certain plants grow there. And every place has certain terrain or topography, the shape of the land, mountainous or flat. Every place has a biological profile, the animals and bugs and shit that hang out there. Every place has a different hydrology, uh, rivers and streams and lakes. And every place has all of this stuff whether it has humans there or not, okay? But just like every space on the planet has physical features, every place also does have human or cultural features, such as we could identify regions by the language or the way that they dress or ethnicity or the race, although that one's much more fuzzier we've already talked about. The diet, what do people eat in this place? Religions, oh, that's always an important one to identify what's happening in an area in a very unique way. Interaction with nature. There's just a whole host of things that humans do to build human culture, which you could just look at the region just for cultural stuff and identify lots of different homogeneous traits all over planet Earth. What we're gonna do here is kind of put those two things together because that is what happens on planet Earth. Every place on the planet, every small town, every state, every country, every region, has physical characteristics melted in with the cultural characteristics of the people that live there to form this unique character of every region on planet Earth, every town on planet Earth. It's like snowflakes. They're all unique when you put these two things together. Things like unique architectures that are formed and custom fitted for different climates and vegetation regimes around the planet. Different modes of transportation, different fuel use dependent upon what people like to drive, what they can afford to drive, or what's the cheapest energy they have. Unique religious structures all around planet Earth. Unique holy spaces. Unique resource development based on what they have, what they don't have, and what they have to export or import. 
unique urban landscapes and unique rural landscape, unique sports and entertainment in different parts of the planet, unique dietary or even unique drinking regions. Are you in from a beef consuming place or a not beef consuming place? Is that because you have cows and choose to eat them in one area or perhaps you don't have any cows at all in the other area or maybe you do have cows but religiously choose not to eat them? Or are you from a vodka consuming place versus a tequila consuming region? And that might be based upon the available plant life that you would make into alcohols and over history and tradition that's what you do. Or maybe you're from the Middle East. Ah, great homogeneous trait. They don't drink alcohol at all across the entire region. So are they a coffee drinking region, a tea drinking region, or milk drinking region, or a water drinking region? You can look at all of the physical world and the cultural world, put them together to form up these homogeneous traits for each of the world regions. But to do that brings us full circle to our last point. The last tool we need in our toolbox to understand the world is generalization. To form up these homogeneous traits which we've just now talked about, you're gonna have to make some generalizations. And generalizations about those traits to form up those unique regions. Please know this going in. When you're generalizing, you're pretty much saying, here's roughly what's going on in this place. Here's roughly their ethnicity or their religion or the way they act or what they eat. Here's roughly the physical world. Here's roughly kind of what's happening economically and politically. There are exceptions, of course, when you generalize. No matter what your homogeneous trait you pick, you're gonna say, oh, it's an iced tea drinking area. Of course there are exceptions. No matter what trait you pick, there's going to be a place, a person, a bunny, a something that's different than whatever you're talking about. It's just the way generalization works, but we have to do it. We can't understand every fact and figure in the entire planet simultaneously. The brain wants us to do this. We're like, no, tell me roughly what's happening here and here and here. I just want you to understand, yes, I understand that there are exceptions to this rule. And I want you to understand that I understand that you understand there are exceptions to this rule. Some of you are from other parts of the planet and I may say some things identifying some homogeneous trait in a region and you're gonna say, no, I'm from there. That doesn't apply to me. I don't drink iced tea. I know, I got it. This is a generalization. There are always exceptions. In fact, there's some glaring exceptions but that can't stop us from using this as a tool to understanding the world. Big exception, great example, the Middle East. Of course, it's a fantastic homogeneous trait that overwhelmingly we identify that region with Islam. Almost everybody's Muslim in this part of the world. It's a great way to identify the region, except the 100% state of Israel, which is Jewish. And that glaring exception does complicate the picture for our tidy regional definition. When big exceptions like that occur, I will point them out, we will discuss and talk about them, but I want you to get that even when a major glaring exception doesn't happen, of course there are those that won't agree with the overgeneralization anyway. Small groups of people, it will, no matter what you say about Russia, how you define it, there's gonna be somebody in Russia that says, that doesn't apply to me. We got it. This is largely dependent on the last term I want you to know, which is scale. Now, when you think about scale, you think about you're looking at a map and it's a little thing in the corner that says one inch equals 100 miles. Yeah, that's a scale. For this class, all I want you to know is the scale is talking about how big or how small of an area are we talking about here, okay? When we're building this regional definition, we're thinking about this homogeneous trait, how big of an area are you talking about? With this in mind, the larger area that you generalize about, the more exceptions to your homogeneous trait will occur. If you focus on a smaller, smaller, smaller area, usually the less exceptions, okay? Because generally everything's going about the same in a small area. Even in a small area though, there can be exceptions. Let me give you an example. Let's say we're going to build some regions at different scales based upon voting in the United States, voting preferences in the United States. So if we looked at a single county, we could say, hey, well, that county's divided up into four different voting districts. So we could say, hey, there's four different regions within that county. Let's go to one region in the last election, that region of the county voted overwhelmingly Democrat. So we could say, hey, this little voting district is overwhelmingly Democrat, that's a region. It's a generalization, of course somebody voted Republican, but it's a great generalization about that little area. Ah, but if you step back in scale and say, oh, look at the whole county. The whole county actually as a whole voted Republican. 
Ah, okay. Well, now we'll change and say, okay, well, generally speaking, the whole county is a Republican region then. But hold on. Back up the scale. Look at the whole state. Maybe the whole state voted the other way. Democrat. So, okay, the whole state is generally a Democratic state. Whoa, hey, ho, back it up. But the entire country voted Republican. So you could, using this homogeneous traits, generalization, making regions, say, yes, the United States is a Republican region based upon this homogeneous trait. And that would be a perfectly logical thing to say and to do, and you could do that, it's user defined. However, now you understand, of course there's a ton of exceptions to that rule. Even at the very, very, very small county level, there'll be people in that little region you've identified that say, no, I didn't vote that way, so that doesn't apply to me. Yeah, I know, we get that. And the bigger the region you get to, and you say, oh, the whole United States is Republican. Oh, wait a minute, now you're gonna offend like half the population or just less than half based upon that voting preference. So now do you get it? It's all contingent upon that scale. The smaller the area, usually the tighter, the tighter your generalization is, the bigger, the more exceptions there are gonna be. Now, having said that, let's put it all together now and wrap this baby up. All together for our class, here are the regions of the world as defined by me. I'm the user for this class. You can disagree. I want you to disagree. If you think, I don't like the way he's formed up these regions. I don't believe in those homogeneous traits. I don't think they apply. Good for you. But for this class, for this semester, here are the regions that I see fit to talk about, we'll be teaching you about, as defined by my analysis of current events and history and other important homogeneous traits. And we will be talking about these. They are in your textbook. So let's go through them just one at a time, very quickly, because I want you to be able to identify these things. We'll start right at home. North America, you'll see right from the get-go, we're not talking about the North American continent. That's geology, this is a geography class. The North American region for this class, by my definition, is just the United States and Canada. And right from the get-go, you might say, well, why would you disclude Mexico? It's right next door. Yes, that's right, think about it. Are there homogeneous traits which apply to the U.S. and Canada, which are different once you cross that U.S.-Mexican border into Mexico? Of course. I'll bet you could think of a half dozen in less than 10 seconds. That's the whole point of region, the whole point of it being user-defined. Yeah, there's something different from region to region here. So let's continue on. So Mexico is a separate region. It's a state, but also a region for our class, which is different from Central America to its south. In Central America and Mexico are quite different from the Caribbean in culture as well as being different from South American region, bump across the Atlantic to Western Europe, which while is very similar to Eastern Europe, Eastern Europe still re retains some distinctions that I want you to know about, so we'll make it a different region. Over to Russia, quite distinct from every place else on planet Earth, down to the Middle East, and you'll see that I've carved out Turkey, no pun intended, carving the Turkey. We carved out Turkey as a separate region for reasons that I will talk about. Almost no one in the world who writes textbooks would agree with not including Turkey in the Middle East. But it's my region, it's my class, here's how I define it, and you'll understand why by the end of this course. Let's head south to Sub-Saharan Africa, which is wildly different from the Middle East, and bump over to Asia for the rest of these. Central Asia, South Asia, powerhouse India in the middle there, East Asia, and you see that that is Eastern China and the Koreas. I've even split China in half for that region. Half of China is in Central Asia, the other half in East Asia, and this will become perfectly clear by the end of the course why that is. Uh, and that's different from Southeast Asia, and even Japan, look at that. Japan, another state, but also region, is extremely distinct and completely different from China and Russia right next door. And finally, we'll round out our regions with Australia, New Zealand. Now. Those are the regions we're gonna be talking about during the course of this course. You don't gotta agree with them. You may dispute along the way. That's healthy, that's good, that's great. But do know them for this class when I talk about Central Asia or the Middle East or South America, kind of what I'm talking about. And to help you along, make sure you got this, here's a little flash animation for you to practice on so you'll know your world regions for this class.